Tonight on KQED Newsroom, from immigration to cybersecurity, former Homeland Security Chief Janet Napolitano talks with us about how to keep America safe. Also, divisions at the border. A court ruling on asylum seekers deals yet another blow to the Trump administration's immigration policies. And Valerie Jarrett, former senior advisor to President Obama, shares her journey from segregated Chicago to the White House. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with Homeland Security. Janet Napolitano headed the Department of Homeland Security under President Obama from 2009 to 2013. When she took over, the agency was less than a decade old, but was responsible for a vast range of security challenges, including immigration, terrorism, cybersecurity, and natural disaster response. In her new book, How Safe Are We?, Napolitano surveys the nation's security gaps and rising threats. She argues that policy fights over border security and immigration are missing the mark. She says the most urgent threats Americans currently face are climate change and cybersecurity. Joining me now is former Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano. She currently heads the University of California system. Nice to have you back on our program. Thank you. I have to ask you first of all about the chaotic week that we have seen at the Department of Homeland Security. Secretary Kirsten Nielsen resigned under pressure then just one day later the director of the Secret Service was gone. What do you make of these developments? Oh I think they're very worrisome. Uh, there are lots of other vacancies in the leadership ranks of the department right now and this is a, a, a department which has massive responsibilities for the security of the country so this kind of leadership instability uh, I think should worry us all. A key issue behind the purge is immigration. Uh, border officials say they're seeing nearly 100,000 migrants a month at the border and that surge isn't uh, slowing down. Is there something to be said for President Trump's uh, need for a hardline approach when he says that's exactly what we need right now. Well, he, he's been uh, pursuing a hardline approach for two years now, and it's not working, and it doesn't work for a number of reasons. Um, but the, the, the issues at the border now need to be dealt with differently. They need to be dealt with by a real strategy, uh, not rhetoric. Um, and what it requires is putting more manpower at the border, putting more manpower at the ports of entry, putting more immigration judges right at the border so that asylum claims can be processed fairly and expeditiously. What about his call for constructing a border wall? <laughs> no, uh, a wall is a symbol, it's not a strategy. And the notion that we're going to construct a, a wall across 1,940 miles of border, um, it, it's, and it's expensive, and, and it won't work. Uh, and that's, that's the important thing. What will work uh, is adding manpower, adding more technology, uh, sustaining air cover across the border. That's a real strategy. You know, under the Obama administration, we drove migration across the southwest border to 40-year lows and we did it by having a multi-pronged strategy not a wall. Speaking of technology what you which you just brought up your book is a report card of sorts on how the nation is doing on security and in it you say one of the areas where we're performing very poorly is cybersecurity, covering everything from voting systems to companies that have information on our banking data our uh, medical records what should we be doing right now in the area of cybersecurity and technology that 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 will help us protect the nation better. So cybersecurity is enormously complex. I mean, there are so many players. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you've got the federal government, and uh, lots of agencies in the federal government touch on federal uh, touch on cyber. Uh, you've got state and localities. You've got the private sector that plays a very important role, and you have our international allies and others because, as we know, cyber doesn't respect national borders. One of the things I recommend in the book is that we have uh, a presidentially established commission uh, that brings together the stakeholders. And I outline 10 specific questions that such a commission should address. But we, we de desperately need more leadership in this area than, than we've seen to date. And you say the other biggest national security threat we're facing is climate change. You mm -hmm. write, quote, the magnitude is universal. The threat is the threat likelihood is 100 percent. But we have a situation now where 
we have a president who doesn't agree with that and who has vowed to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord. So given the current political situation, how do we go about mitigating the threat of climate change? Well, I think we should address it in two ways. Num number one, uh, the United States needs to play its part in reducing the rate of uh, climate change that already is occurring. That's why we should stay in the Paris Accords. But number two, we need to focus on adaptation to the climate change that already has occurred. And this gets down into some very pragmatic, weedy subjects. Um, where do we build our roads? How do we construct our bridges? What kinds of building materials do we use? How do we encourage the development of firewise communities in areas that uh, are near these um, drought, um, uh, drought uh, for, you know, forests that are impacted yes. by drought? Um, uh, you know, that whole question of adaptation is a function of uh, really looking at the problems that are, are now and understanding that climate is actually a security risk because it impacts the safety of America. And those are things that cities and states can do independent of the government. Absolutely. And and ought to be doing and, and need to be doing it very intentionally, understanding that, you know, uh, the sea levels are rising. I think of this every time I take off from the Oakland airport and you look out, uh, you know, at where the where the water is yeah. next to the to the runway. Um, but, you know, sea levels are rising on, on both coasts. We see the, the increasing frequency and intensity of weather events, landfall, yeah. hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, wildfires out west. We had a disastrous season last year in California. Uh, we, we need to do much more by way of adaptation. Yeah. Let's uh, switch gears and talk about the college admission scandal. Uh, both UCLA and UC Berkeley have been implicated. And last month, you ordered an internal investigation. What are you finding so far? Have you found any other UC campuses uh, that are guilty of similar activities? So, um, uh, first of all, I was so angry when that case um, uh, came down because, you know, we really uh, try to do admissions and turn very square corners so that students are admitted on their merits, uh, not because of some undue influence. Um, so um, our head of our audit um, office uh, is conducting an investigation. Uh, we're currently mapping what each of the campuses does by way of anything approaching special admissions, like for example, for athletics or musicians or theater arts uh, majors. Um, and once we have that mapped where we uh, identify areas of particular risk, we'll drill down even more thoroughly on those. Will there be any penalties for the students who are involved? You know, that will involve looking at the facts of each individual student's case. Did the student know, should the student have known that they were getting in based on an unfair influence? And so uh, those students will be looked at individually. And, and what are you doing now to tighten UC's own procedures to help uh, prevent fraudulent admissions? So, um, first of all, we have to identify, um, you know, where are the possible risks in the system? Uh, and that's what um, our investigation is aimed at identifying now. Um, so, uh, just, just to be clear, uh, um, students are evaluated based on 14 criteria. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, some categories. We have something called admissions by exception. This is for students who are not otherwise eligible for the university. Um, they could be homeschooled. Uh, they could be from some rural high schools that don't offer the requisite uh, classes. But you'll take um, those things into account. We can take those things okay. into account. Um, it's a very, very small number of our admittees, but we want to look at that. Okay. And then there's a whole category of special admissions. These are students who are eligible for the university, uh, but they get in because of a special talent. Um, athletics, mm -hmm. music, uh, I already mentioned those kinds of things. That, that's a, a system that we also want to make sure um, is very tight. All right, Janet Napolitano, head of the UC system, and your new book out is called How Safe Are We? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Moving on now to a deeper focus on immigration. Today, the Trump administration said it will seek an emergency court order to keep sending migrants back to Mexico while their asylum claims are decided. Earlier this week, a federal judge in San Francisco had temporarily halted that program. On Wednesday, President Trump traveled to Texas for a fundraiser where he once again claims that illegal border crossings threaten the security of Americans. 
Meanwhile, hundreds of migrants are showing up daily at the border, straining resources to detain them and process their asylum claims. Joining me now with a closer look at the immigration landscape are Julian Aguilar, immigration and border security reporter with the Texas Tribune. He joins us via Skype from El Paso, Texas. And Deep Gula Sekaram, a law professor at Santa Clara University. Nice to have both of you here. Thank you for having me. Julian, let's begin with you. You're there on the border. What have you seen? There is the tide of asylum seekers truly at crisis proportions, as the president says it is. Well, the word crisis has been thrown around a lot, and I think even now Democrats are starting to adopt that term, although they specify it's a humanitarian crisis, where the president and the administration and his supporters say it's a security and humanitarian crisis, uh, you know, which is, enables them to, to push this sort of hardline security stance. But the numbers are definitely increasing. I mean, we saw uh, even last week, a week and a half ago, where Border Patrol was putting uh, asylum seekers underneath the bridge. This is outside. They had a military-style military tent. And they had folks that were sleeping outside, and they said that was because it was it was full. Uh, I've talked to shelter directors, uh, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations that say that they're scrambling to find shelter space for these folks. So they're worried that people are going to end up uh, on the streets, you know, at the bus station, you know, with no with no place to go. So, Professor Gula Sekaram, uh, the Trump administration is now asking for an emergency court order so that it can continue to keep its policy of sending migrants back to Mexico while they wait for their asylum cases to be decided. So what is going to happen with the migrants now, given that there was another federal court order uh, decision earlier this week that said the Trump administration could not send them back to Mexico? That's right. So on Monday, a federal court judge said the Trump policy, which is known colloquially as uh, the remain in Mexico policy, could, was not legal and therefore the administration couldn't go on enforcing it. The Trump administration is asking a higher court to review it and uh, is also asking that higher court to set aside the first court's ruling. But until that higher court makes that decision, the lower court ruling stays in effect, which means that the policy it cannot be enforced. All right, so still some uncertainty there. Deep, the Trump administration, meanwhile, reportedly wants to tighten the rules around who can receive asylum. And in the past, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions had suggested that people should rarely be granted asylum based on domestic violence or gang violence claims. Where does the current Attorney General, William Barr, stand on that? Well, it's hard to know. The, as you mentioned, uh, when Jeff Sessions was the attorney general, he took a case to himself. It's a very rare step for an attorney general to do. And in that case, he made a blanket ruling, essentially, that he thought that underneath the asylum standards, people fleeing from domestic violence or gang violence would not be able to make those claims. That uh, His attempt to change the policy in that regard was overturned by a court, by a federal court. As with regards to William Barr, it's not clear yet. When he was the former, the attorney general under George H.W. Bush, he took a fairly law and order stance towards immigration, but we're in a different time. Uh, from the news that's coming out more recently, he's uh, trying to implement policies to streamline the appeals process, to make it quicker, uh, to not allow, I think, the full process rights that uh, asylum seekers might have. And so while he may not be implementing the same exact policy as Sessions, it's clear also that he is willing to take the hardline immigration stances. And, and so how much of the situation we're currently seeing at the border, how much of that is beyond the U.S. government's control, and how much of it is self-inflicted due to strict detention policies that have been put in place? Right. I think one of the misconceptions that the federal government is laboring under, at least the Trump administration, is that migration and migration control at the border is something that the United States can unilaterally stop. The fact is you have Central American countries, especially the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, which are at this point on the verge of being failed states, corrupt governments, extreme violence. People are running uh, from extreme depra uh, depra uh, desperation. They're, they need to travel 2,000 miles just to get to the border, some with families. Under those conditions, the, the number of people and families that are coming is unlikely to be stopped by an enforcement-only policy. So, so detention is not a deterrent if they're willing to risk death to make these dangerous journeys. That's exactly right. I mean, people make these journeys knowing that there is a risk of death, knowing that if they're going to cross illegally, that is six, seven days in the dead of heat in the desert where people die and routinely die doing that, and yet they're willing to do it. Um, and so what has been proven over the last three, four years, if not uh, even beyond that, is things like deter um, detention, family separation, family detention, these things, an enforcement-only policy is not going to deter asylum seekers.
So the original court order stays in place. But Julian, what does this mean then for the uh, asylum seekers who have already been sent back to Mexico? From what I understand, speaking to some of the attorneys with the ACLU who argued this case before the judge in California, those folks are going to be stuck in Mexico until their court date. Uh, for example, I spoke to a family last week whose court date is April 25th. They are stuck in Ciudad Juarez until that. But from what my understanding is that once they appear before the judge for the first court date, then they cannot be resent back to Mexico. So they're going to have to wait it out. Uh, fortunately, some court dates are earlier than others. Huyan, the president has purged top leadership at the Department of Homeland Security, and he's been sending big signals about uh, whether he'll revive a version of the controversial family separation program. Do you have any indication at this point as to who is leading immigration policy at the White House? Well, the president took offense to the notion that he was cleaning house, and he said, you know, it's, it's all up to him. But we have seen him, you know, replace high-ranking officials that, you know, for example, a former Secretary Nielsen, who apparently was not as tough as he wanted her to be on immigration. So I think that's caused a lot of concern for the immigrant rights community, that the person who put in place family separations wasn't, quote-unquote, tough enough for the president. So, um, you know, the president changes what he says from one day to the next. So who's really in charge of things could change by this time next week. And deep, roughly three quarters of the immigrants being detained are held in for-profit facilities, in part because the government doesn't have enough room for uh, them in government-run facilities. And last October, government inspectors released a scathing report about the conditions and the treatment of detainees at one of those facilities in Adelanto. What legal rights do these migrants have at the facilities, at the for-profit facilities? And, and how do they compare to those at government-run facilities? Right. I mean, certainly what... what what we see now is a great incentive for the government to accomplish detention through the use of for-profit detention companies, private companies. Part of the reason the government likes that is because then, uh, one, they don't have the responsibility of doing it, and it gives them legal barriers to certain types of suits that people might bring. So uh, with regards to the, the conditions in these places, right now we're starting to see some suits starting to make their way through state courts, some federal courts, about the conditions of confinement, uh, which, as you said, government reports have already shown that there, there have been um, the conditions there violate some basic ideas of how people should be held. Uh, but that is part of the problem with the private detention center. One, it's a big driver of our immigration enforcement system. And two, the conditions there are hard to monitor, hard to bring to account through litigation. But it also creates an incentive to keep people in detention if, if these are privately run for-profit centers. That's exactly right. I mean, if one wants to think about it, this is the private immigration detention industrial complex, and you can already see the effects of it. There is currently a congressional mandate that uh, Congress is going to pay for roughly 35,000 immigration beds a night. People are trying to push that to 50,000. You can bet that the major lobbyists for that are going to be from the private detention companies. Julian, you've interviewed asylum seekers at the border. There have been many shifting policies from the Trump administration uh, on immigration. What are you hearing from them about their reaction to those policy changes? And, and does that affect their decision on whether to cross the border? Well, their decision is ultimately made up by the fact that they can't live in those countries. You know, a lot of folks saying, look, I got to get out of Central America. It's too dangerous. But what sort of, you know, makes them feel better about it or, or makes them uh, feel that the time is right is the fact that the smugglers know to tell them that all these policies are on hold, that the wall is coming up. So their time to get out of there and seek asylum in the United States is now. All right. Julian Aguilar with the Texas Tribune joining us from live from El Paso, Texas uh, via Skype. Thank you very much. And also thanks to Professor Deep Gula Sekaram with Santa Clara University. Thank you. Now to the life journey of former President Obama's longest serving senior advisor. Valerie Jarrett joined the Obama administration in 2009, stayed for both terms, and was a longtime family confidant. Before entering public service, she worked as a corporate lawyer while raising her daughter as a single mother. Since then, she's become one of the most influential African-American women of the 21st century, advocating for gender equality, civil rights, and criminal justice reform. In her new book, Finding My Voice, Jarrett sheds light on key moments of the Obama presidency, while also revealing intimate details of her own life. 
Valerie Jarrett is now senior advisor to the Obama Foundation, and she joins me now. So nice to have you here. Thank you, thank you. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you today. Uh, you, you had such an interesting childhood. Your father was a pathologist uh, and moved the family to Iran in the 1950s because there were, there were more opportunities at that time in Iran than in America for black doctors. You were born in Iran. Uh, how has that experience of living overseas helped shape you? I think it shaped me in several ways. First of all, I grew up in a hospital compound with physicians, children from all over the world. So British, French, from the United States, you name it, Iranian physicians. And we children all played together and found ways of relating to one another, even though we came from different countries and spoke even different languages. And so that's one thing. The other thing is I think spending time outside of the United States gives you a better appreciation for all we have going for us here. And it was everything from clean water and food and not having to worry about certain diseases to our civil liberties. Yeah. And the final thing I learned is that the United States is the greatest country on earth. It's not the only country on earth. And we can learn a great deal beyond our shores. And I think those early years gave me a perspective on the world and, and how we fit into the broader context. And President Obama also spent time growing up overseas. Uh, he came back to America. Did that um, create a significant bond for the two of you when you first met him? It did. In fact, the first time the three of us had dinner, Michelle Robinson, Barack Obama, and, and myself, they weren't even married. And she we was only bonded. At the she time, was a Michelle kid, Obama. exactly. And we bonded around the life experiences that he and I had, and, and the three lessons that I just explained were similar to what he felt mm -hmm. growing up in his formative years in Indonesia. In your book, you talk about the racism and the sexism you encountered in Chicago, where you practiced law and before becoming a power player in city politics. How did those experiences uh, affect the way you approach your role once you got to the White House? I think my early uh, life, my professional life, uh, where I had a sense of feeling like an other and not necessarily welcome and not connecting with the people, made me more deliberate about bringing people in and making them feel included and listening to the people around me, particularly with those who had different life experiences. It enriched my decision making and it made them feeling a part, feel as though they were part of a team. And the other thing I realized at my big law firm is that it wasn't for me. And I was miserable, and I talk very openly in my book about my marriage, and it wasn't fulfilling. And I felt like a failure as opposed to it just didn't work out. Mm. And I think I had to find that inner strength to be resilient and get back up on my feet. And I would look at my daughter every day and I'd say, go do something that's going to make her proud of you. Mm. And step up to the plate and be a whole person and not look for somebody else to complete you. And so in a sense, when things fell apart, that was the best thing that could have happened to me. It forced me outside of my comfort zone. It made me appreciate the magic of the zigzag, the adventure of the zigzag. As opposed to a straight line. As opposed to the straight line that I was on, yeah. but it was somebody else's straight line. It wasn't mm. my straight line, and I listened to the quiet voice, the one that's inside of you, and that's what motivated me to join local government. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about um, the current administration. It's rolled back some key legislative achievements during the Obama years. What are your thoughts on that, on things like the Affordable Care Act, for example? Well, I'm very concerned uh, that the thought of repealing the Affordable Care Act would leave 20 million Americans without health insurance, some who have it for the first time. One in two Americans who have a pre-existing condition would now be vulnerable to losing their health insurance or seeing their premiums jacked up. Women who now have access to preventive care without a copay, young people who can stay on their parents' plans until they're 26, mm. senior citizens who were before the Affordable Care Act cutting their drugs in half to make them stretch. And so I really worry about what message are we sending to the people of our country that we would strip such an important benefit away from them? And I'd like to ask you about the presidential race as well. Um, Joe Biden was vice president under Obama, and you got to know him very well during the eight years you were there. He's now accused of inappropriate contacts with women. What are your thoughts about the allegations against him? Well, I think he had it right when he said it's a new day, times have changed, and it's important for men to listen. And that it isn't just what your intent is, it's how is it affecting the person to whom it was directed. So I found that encouraging. I worked with him for eight years, day in and day out. He was a very important counselor to President Obama, advised him on all matters, both foreign and domestic, and so he was an integral part of our team. But I think he and all the other men out there need to appreciate the fact that times have changed. And having him speak out to that 
sends a message to other men as well. Some people, though, have suggested that, you know, times are just different now, and that just doesn't fly anymore. And he, he sort of stopped short of completely apologizing. Do you think his alleged behavior should disqualify him from running for president? I think one of the great things about America is that anyone can run, and it's up to the American people to decide what's disqualifying and what's not. And the fact that we have, this is early in the campaign, in fact, he hasn't even jumped in the campaign yet, <laughs> means that we have time to get to know all the candidates. I think in the Democratic field, we have an embarrassment of riches. There's so many outstanding candidates who are running and those who are considering running. And I think he and everyone else, if he decides to run, gets to make their case directly to the people. We get to decide. If you were a senior advisor to the 2020 presidential candidates now, yes. what would you tell them? A few things. And I've had the privilege of speaking with some of them who are running, and my message to them has been the same. It's been be authentic, be optimistic about our country, explain why the American people should trust your vision and your ability to execute your vision. I also have said to them, keep the long view in mind. Don't beat up the others in the primary so much that we go into the general election in a wounded state because the long view is winning the presidency, not just the primary. And finally, I say that there's a difference between campaigning, where you try to grow your base and go after those folks and speak to them and have bold ideas, and governing, where you have to be the president for all of America. And you have to make sure that you are willing to compromise and that you don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And as I was reading your book, it resonated with me personally. We talked a little bit about this because I grew up somewhere else, too, in Vietnam, came here as a refugee. I'm also a single mother. You were a single mother for a very long time. Uh, more broadly, though, for the broad audience, what do you hope readers will take away from reading your book? I hope that they will realize the importance of every voice. I hope they'll learn to listen to their own voices and that they will feel a sense of empowerment to use their, for their voices to be a force for good for others. I think we're all inextricably linked, and I believe that we have a responsibility in our community towards one another, and that uh, I hope going forward that what continues is what I've seen all over the country, just amazingly ordinary people doing incredible things, and that comes from this sense of confidence that I can make a difference. It is a very optimistic book. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations. Thank you on very book, much. Finding My Voice. Always nice to have you here. Hope to have you back. Love being with you. And that will do it for us. As always, to find more of our coverage, you can go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.